So we're going to look at a piece today. It's a well-known anthem, God So Loved the World, by the English organist and composer John Stainer. We might look at a little bit of the context of this piece, first of all. Um, it's part of a much larger work, a Passion Tide cantata called The Crucifixion. So its context is Passion Tide, and this anthem is often sung in Holy Week or for, for the particular services of Passion Tide, and it finds its rightful place there. Um, but if you look at the scriptural context, then we find that it's got many other things to say as well. It's from uh, the Gospel of John, and these words that Christ speaks when um, the Pharisee Nicodemus scurries to see him late at night, probably so that no one will see him, going to find out what this strange man is all about. And Christ listens to the words, uh, listens to the questions that Nicodemus has, and part of his answer is this great text, God so loved the world. And we're going to have a little look at this text now and just explore it a little bit more and see what themes it has to say to us. The first task is the choice of an edition. And these days, with everything that's up on the internet, there's a huge variety now for most of the repertoire we might be thinking of doing. I have an old edition of this work, the whole crucifixion here, the old novello edition, um, which has God so loved the world in the middle. And it's great actually to see it in context. It's good to know that this little anthem is in the middle of a huge work for organ and choir with soloists, but just in the middle, right in the middle of the crucifixion narrative, there is this unaccompanied short anthem which has these wonderful words. So it's, it's good to have that and, and to know where the piece is coming from. However, I had a look on the internet as well where there are a number of editions of this piece available. Interestingly, I can only find one that actually has exactly what Stainer wrote. One needs to be very careful on the internet. Sometimes the notes can be wrong even. Certainly things like dynamics, um, indications of, of tempi and that sort of thing can vary hugely. And some of the editors who put material up on the internet don't take enough care over this sort of thing. But this edition that I've found, um, it's Raphael Ornes, and I find that his work on the internet is actually usually very accurate. So here we have his version of God So Loved the World and pretty much mirroring exactly what Stainer wrote. There's one exception, there's a Rallentando mark which is half a bar early, but I think we can forgive him that. So we've got our edition and I'm going to use this internet edition now um, in having a look at how we might prepare the score. The first thing to look at is perhaps the structure of the piece. Does it repeat at all? Is there material that repeats? And of course, in this piece there is. So you'll notice that the beginning in bar one uh, appears again at bar 38. So there's a sort of ABA structure with the central section beginning in bar 24 through to 37 uh, in the relative minor and cadencing in its dominant. The next thing to do is to get to know the actual dots, get to know the notes. If you're going to rehearse a choir in any piece, you need to know where the pitfalls are. You need to get to know the piece horizontally. Sing all the parts through, perhaps with a keyboard to prompt if there are any tricky moments, and get to know in each part where the pitfalls are. And then get to know the piece vertically so that you understand the harmony. And of course, keyboard skills are very useful here if you have them. This particular edition, of course, has a, a reduction as well for the, for the keyboard, which helps that, though it makes it clear it's just for rehearsal as does Stainer in his original. And then when you do that, you can see that there are some interesting moments in all the parts which come from this particular harmonic language. So we're talking about um, a very chromatic language, some might say rather saccharine even, where there are some little chromatic twists and condensial moments and that really color the meaning of the words here and there as well. And some to watch out for, for instance, at the opening the altos in bar five, they have an E sharp, and then two bars later they have an E natural. And it's good to know about that, to have identified that in advance so that you'll be ready to help them just make that adjustment from E sharp to E natural and perhaps that rehearse that little moment on its own. In bars nine and 10, the tenors have an A sharp. Again, 
this little chromatic moment where they just go up a semitone and then another one, A, A sharp, B. These are the little moments to look out for. A little later on, we've got, for instance, um, at the end of the B section, there are some chromatic moments there for the basses and then E sharps and G sharps towards the end. And what I would do is just put a little ring around some of these so you know where they're going to come and so that you can be ready for them when they do. Let's now look at how we might mark up the score uh, in terms of the detail that we will need in order to bring the, the piece alive, to bring the text off the page. It's important that we're able to give our singers the information they need, particularly things like where to put consonants. Singers, unlike instrumentalists, need to be able to place consonants at the ends of phrases so that everyone comes off neatly. And there are some moments here where it's good to think about that. So in the first phrase, we've got uh, the word world with four beats and then a crotchet rest. And it really helps to just think of the LD coming on the crotchet rest. And then in the next phrase, there's a comma after the, the word world. But my feeling would be that that's best left out, that we should take this phrase in one breath, so we would mark a carry-on between world and that in all the parts. So that, that really goes through to begotten son. This way we're sort of picking up a technique that Stainer uses here and many composers um, through the centuries have used of transferring the accent, making a little statement, then adding a little bit more to that statement and then transferring the accent through. So we have God so loved the world, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. These longer phrases where we take the accent a little bit later. In bar 12, we have a breath after sun, and it would be good to think about how long that word should be sung so that people make a neat ending to it. And I would say a dotted crotchet with a quaver, and that gives everyone the chance to really place a vocalized N on the quaver rest, san. It's good to think about that and to write it in. It makes it very, very clear. Then we will take a breath after believeth. We might put a little underline there so that we stress believeth and then the next phrase we transfer the accent through to him and here again we might do the same thing that we did with the n before we write write an a m there so that we give that word good finish with a good m sound on the crotchet rest there should not perish there are consonants here that need to be really strongly uh, strongly sung and I would just underline the D and the N, should not, and even the T and the P, that people really get those consonants nice and strong. Be listening out for that straight away. And perish, I think we need to time that consonant as well. And if we follow the pattern of earlier, we're going to make all of these half beat cutoffs where the sh sound is put on the, on the quaver rest there. <laughs> The next phrase, again, I think we'll transfer the accent. Should not perish, should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we're going to put a carry on there and really sing through to that word life. If we're going to encourage good support on that word, and it's very high, look how high the bases are on a D there, okay, and doubling the tenors as well. It's quite a ringing chord that, and it needs good support of us to stay in tune. So I would encourage people to think of the F, the consonant that ends it, on the rest that follows. So we put the F at the beginning of the next bar so that they sing right through to that moment. And that connects then to the next phrase. Then we have another important cutoff. This is at the end of the B section, but that the world through him might be saved before we go back to God. And we've got a, a dotted minimum there at the end of that phrase. And then we start again with the A section. We could go on in time there, or we could think about that slightly differently. Perhaps that's a moment just to take some time and add some space in between uh, the phrase that ends there and the return of the opening material. 
This would depend on your building, really, and if you've a very resonant building, you can take a lot of time. If you've quite a dry building with not much resonance or echo, then you might want to go on pretty much in time. But it's good to have an idea about how you want to treat that. And what I'm going to do for now is just put a cesura on the bar line so that we'll take some time there and then restart with the opening material. Moving towards the end, because of course we repeat a lot of the material that we've had near the beginning, we need to think about how we're going to treat the end of the piece on the last page here. Diminuendo e rallentando in bar 65. Uh, it's important that that rallentando doesn't begin too soon. And in fact, Stainer has it in the following bar. So I would just put a little arrow there just to keep the movement in the diminuendo bar and don't begin the, the pull up until a little bit later. So there we have a few nuts and bolts that we've sorted out. Detail that will help the choir give a performance which lifts the text off the page and makes it clearer and perhaps more meaningful for everyone who's present, for all of those who are listening.